Okay, welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. We're here with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly, and our special guest today, Bad News Allen from Calgary, a uh, longtime wrestler, 22 years in the business, just having retired about a year ago. And uh, I want to ask you also, um, now, the did you have one knee done or two knees done um, uh, this past year? Done. You, had, you had them both done? How are you, yeah, how are you progressing from... Uh, actually, you, I was having trouble with my right knee, and it kept going out on me. And uh, when I went in to see the specialist, he decided to actually it both of them. He said that actually the left was worse than the right. He said, I'll do one first, and then you come back in six months later, and I'll do the other one. And I don't particularly like being in a hospital, so I said, well, is, is there any way possible you can do both at the same time? He said, sure. So that's what happened. They did both of them at the same time. And how was the recovery with, with from, from having two knees done? Oh, very good. Oh, really? I done five years ago. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They, how, how do you like... Oh, sorry, sorry. Let, let me keep, keep going. Uh, yeah. I'm, I mean, they, I can walk now without pain, and uh, I can even start to jog a little bit, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. How do you like doing the uh, Color on the Stampede shows? Uh, I enjoy it. You know, uh, uh, my uh, partner and uh, play-by-play guy, he's, he really cracks me up, you know. Uh, I'm always written him about being a bot because he gets so excited sometimes, but I really enjoy doing it. Yeah. What, what, um, is, is there a favorite, for, for you personally, a favorite style of wrestling? Because you've done uh, UWFI, you've done New Japan, you did WWF, Stampede. Does it, did, or did it even really matter to you? Well, I thought that the, the uh, actually the uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling and uh, Stampede at the time, uh, when Dynamite and them were here, I thought they were sort of close, similar. And I enjoyed that style because it was um, uh, really more or less sort of hardcore, but it didn't go like, you know, the nonsense that they're going now today, you know. But uh, I enjoyed that more than anything else. There was there was an incident, I just guess it pops into my head, many, many years ago. Um, did something happen with, uh, was it, did you, did, were you with uh, Archie the Stomper Gouldy, or uh, Jeff yeah. Gouldy? Yep. What was the story? What was, in fact, they actually replayed it on Stampede Wrestling um, about a month or two ago. Right, exactly. Um, and I saw the interview with Archie Gouldy, which was a phenomenal interview. Um, oh, yeah. what, was the, what was the story behind all that? Well, the thing was that uh, I was probably the only wrestler in the history up here that ever got suspended, really got suspended by the commission. And they really disliked me, you know. So uh, after my third suspension, I just got off suspension, and, and uh, I came in to do TV, and they came up with the idea they wanted to do this with me and uh, the stopper. They wanted to have a program with him and I, and they had this uh, kid up here who was supposed to be his son. So I told him, I said, look, I said, I'm just off suspension for the third time. I said, you know this commissioner hates me. This guy actually had to try. He actually tried to get his best to actually have me run out the country, and that's a true story. He actually so tried, what, and they said, like, from what, what, what? What were they, like, what, what charges or whatever were they suspending you for? Was it brawling in the crowd or? Well, yeah, you know, it's uh, like well, the first time uh, Dynamite and I, we had, uh, we saw it everywhere we went, and uh, we we did the hardcore thing, and, you know, like I would slam him on the table, and then I went got an axe and went to hit him with the axe, and he moved to chop the table in half and stuff like that, you know. Actually, we the original, the originators of really hardcore wrestling at the time, our, our style, and, uh, you know, the commissioner, he just flipped out. He claimed that nobody else ever did. I mean, they had Abdullah up here and King Curtis. And, you know, they, they uh, I could have been the worst than they were, but they claimed that I was the worst and I should be tired and troubled and driven out the country, you know. But uh, anyway, so they that was the, the program they set up for me and Stomper to work, but it all blew up, of course. They all put the heat on me and said it was my fault. You know? mm. Yeah. So it just it got out of hand, and then like, well, they, they got moved out of Calgary for a while, right? Didn't they have to like run the shows outside the city limits? Uh, yeah, we actually had to uh, run on the South Sea Reserve, which is uh, a native reserve just outside of Calgary. The commissioner had no authority out there, so we actually would run there. And uh, the people would come from the city. It's not that far outside the city, but they would actually come out there and just pack the place. Uh, we'd, we'd run the shows there because... Uh, they actually uh, Stu lost his license in the city. And they wow. Out. Yeah, it was really. And like for two weeks in a row, every day in the Sun newspaper up here, they would run a story on the front page with a picture of me and just all kinds of stuff. It really hit the fan when uh, they went down. Did it make you a stronger heel as far as a draw, all that publicity? Well, you know, it was funny because actually it, was, it got so bad that the people 
you know, they always like to look for the underdog. They actually thought that I was them. They actually turned me a baby face. Oh, really? In fact, the wrestler, yeah. I came in, and the people would actually cheer me because they thought it was sort of unfair that, like I said, King Curtis and Abdul and, you know, Stu had many wrestlers up here for years that have, you know, pretty much done stuff that we've done. And uh, a lot of people really thought it was unfair that they just really attacked me the way they did. So, actually, when I came out, they actually had to turn me a baby face for a while because uh, I was so popular. And then, of course, you know, the way we worked and everything, I wound up turning heel again, uh, again, throwing. But what were your thoughts as far as, like, the different, you know, because you worked against some of the real great workers of that period and people who gained, like, national fame, whether, like, Owen Brett, Dynamite, yeah. Davey Boy Smith, uh, Pillman, I guess. Did you ever work with Pillman, actually? Uh, I know you, yeah, actually, one time I worked with him up in Edmonton. He had a, uh, a helmet match because, you know, he used to play football or something. I never played football, but we did a helmet match anyway. What were, what were your thoughts as far as like those guys? And some of them were in the infancy of their career when you bumped him. Benoit, I mean, yeah. you, you were the one. Who, did you get the, the one who got Benoit in Japan? Yes. Yeah. I'm the one that I got him in. Yeah. What was um, what was it? Did you just take a liking to him and just recommend him to the Japanese, or did he just want to go really bad and uh, you paved the well, way? You know, I'm I'm like one of these guys. I'm I'm a Libra, and uh, we have you know the thing with the scale and everything. We hate to see injustice being done, you know. And I thought that here's a kid that had a lot of talent, a lot of potential, and I think that the officers saw that too, and there was a lot of jealousy there, so they used to do all kinds of stuff to him, and uh, would try to discourage him, and I really got sort of tipped off about it, so uh, he actually moved down from Edmonton into Calgary, and he was living at his aunt's house a few blocks from uh, where, where I, my home was, and I asked him one day, I said, would you ever think about going to Japan? He said, I would love to go. So I said, well, let me talk to a few people, and I went and talked to Nuki because I was like, this was his right-hand man. He used to say anything I wanted, he'd give it to me, you know, because he always liked me. I worked hard, and I never caused any problems. And I asked him, I said, would it be possible we can bring this guy over and put him in the dojo like me and let him train, you know? And he said, sure. And I never asked him for money or anything, and he said, we'll even pay him to, he said, you know, and so that's, we set it up that way, and that's the way uh, it happened. They uh, brought him over and they kept him there and they paid him and everything. He stayed in the dojo and he ate. Uh, he had room and board free and he ate free and he, all he had to do was train to put his money in the bank. Now, how would you compare as far as crowd enthusiasm, as far as fun for yourself? Uh, you were you were in New Japan during I guess that eighty two eighty three eighty four period where where that I guess was the the peak period for them, and uh -huh. then later after that you went to the WWF during a pretty hot period for WWF. Well, well, how, how how would you compare those two atmospheres? Well, you know, at uh, at both uh, both levels. Well, the Japanese, you know, the Japanese audience at that time when I first started over there was a lot different. They were really quiet and everything, and I think once uh, satellite TV came over, they became more boisterous, but. Uh, they always drew good crowds, you know, like, I mean, Inuki was like a god there. And wherever he showed up, the places were always sold out. And it was the same thing when I went to WWF. Uh, Hogan was like a god. I, I knew Hogan uh, before I came to WWF because he used to come to Japan all the time. They always used him well there. And uh, it was the same thing when uh, I came to the WWF for the second time. Actually, he was there once before. I worked for Vince's father. Oh, that's, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, and, just for uh, a little while, yeah. Yeah, 78, I was there for a, uh, a, a small period of time. But actually, when I came, uh, like I said, when I got back and uh, worked as a junior, uh, Hogan was the same thing. He was like God to the people in the States, you know. So it was pretty similar. But I uh, this is... This but, is uh, yeah, you asked me a question, I never did answer it. You know, oh, about Dynamite uh, and all this, guys. Yeah, yeah all these guys that I wrestled with, and I've worked against everybody in the business just about, you know, I thought that, to me, two of the tremendous wrestlers that I ever worked against was uh, Steamboat and, uh, 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 well, Dynamite has to be first, and Steamboat would have to be second. Those mm -hmm. two I thought were two of the greatest wrestlers that I ever worked with. Any, anything about him? Because, uh, like, Dynamite was, you know, you worked a lot with Dynamite, and he was actually yeah. much smaller than you. Yeah, exactly. But he had, it was just, he, he was born for wrestling. I mean, he had everything going for him. He, what he did look good, uh, like I always said, pound for pound, until somebody proves different to this day. I think the closest one is Benoit, probably. Pound for pound, I thought he was the best wrestler in the business ever. And even though he was small, he just had something about him, you know, that, like the, the audience, he brought it out. The, the people, they just wanted to get in there and help him out because he would sell in such a way that, you know, they just wanted to, he would just give a look and uh, 
right with the cap, you know. People just wanted to help him, but, you know, this big heel beat the hell out of him. It was just something about him, just the way he wrestled. That really, uh, people really enjoyed it, you know. But I Do you think there's anything special as far as, like, uh, why you clicked in Calgary so well? Was it just the right the right time? Because you know you were in other territories, um, and Calgary, you kind of became like the top heel for yeah. you know a couple of year period there. Well, like I said, you know, Stu, like he's the kind of guy he don't care what color you are, who you are. You can get out there and do the job. He's gonna give you a chance. And that's the only thing I ever asked for is anybody. I never asked for no special favors or nothing. Just give me a chance to do my thing, and we'll go from there. And he just let me do that, and that's exactly what I did. And the people really brought it. Which I thought in other territories they always uh, sort of just kept a lid on me, you know. They just wanted to have me there, but they really weren't didn't have big plans on doing anything, you know. Like they brought me in and they tell me all this nonsense, but you could always see the handwriting on the wall that was really trying not doing nothing. Were there any territories you went to where you thought you were totally misused? Well, I thought the WWF. I thought that they could have they just let me cut loose and do my stuff, you know, because they actually brought me in there on false pretenses, told me, you know, because. Uh, Actually, when Stu sold his territory, he made arrangements for uh, Dynamite, Davey, Brett, myself to go with Vince. But I didn't go because my wife was having a baby, and I was my last one, and I was always on the road with my other kids. So I figured I was going to be home. But uh, once I came in there, I figured that they would just, you know, because they made a promise to me, well, you know, we never had an African-American world champ before, and this is great, you're a heel and everything, and we're really, you know, we want you to do it. We're gonna uh, when Hogan he's gonna leave and make a movie. He's come back a year later. And he could go all around the territory. And I think this is great, you know. But you know they just brought me in there because uh, I guess he wanted to snatch up everybody. But he really didn't have plans to do much with me because any time that I got the main event or anything, I actually had to fight with him just to get in. It, you know, like he he did it like to throw me clumps, keep me quiet, that type of thing. But he never really kept his word to me. In in, Dy in Dynamite Kid's book, he kind of made the the illusion that uh, you know one of the reasons why he got to work with you so much was because uh, a lot of the wrestlers in the Calgary territory were kind of scared to work with you. I mean, do you think that? I mean, everyone knew you were you were a tough guy from the judo and everything, and even yeah. out of the judo, you had a, you had a big rep in the business. Uh -huh. do you think think there was anything to that, or? Well, you know, that's in their mind. They have to look at that, you know, because like uh, I never came into the business to. To impress anybody, oh yeah, well I was a judo champ and Olympic champ and all this. You know, I came in there to do my job because I always told everybody when I got into the business, I have the scrapbook. I'm in this for the bank book. If I have to do a job every night, as long as you're paying me, that's all I'm concerned about. But I used to have trouble with people when they would lie to me and then they wouldn't pay me the money they're supposed to pay me. Then of course they're going to hear my mouth. But you know, it's like a lot of these guys too that they never done anything outside the business. And what they would like to do is get young guys in there and just jerk them around, you know, pull all kinds of stuff on them. But, you know, I wasn't going to have that. I mean, I go in there and do my job, but if you get out of line, I'm going to straighten you out. It's that simple. This is, this is an email we got here from Frank Jewett who says that uh, these are, I think these are questions um, regarding the, uh, okay, was, from your perspective as a worker, how different was the UWFI style from the traditional pro wrestling style that you had worked? And what did you like or not like about the style? And he also says, the UWFI had some high-profile instances of double-crossing and non-cooperation. Uh, he mentions uh, Tamura, Matthew Saad, Muhammad, Gary Albright, Tamura. I don't know if you're aware of those. I'm not even sure. I know the whole story behind those yeah. two. Um, but anyway, did you ever feel like someone was trying to double-cross you when you were in the UWFI? Well, yeah, they did it uh, actually at the end. You know, like they brought me in the uh, same thing again. You know, it, what, what the thing was, if it was just a total shoot, then you would have to win on your own, lose on your own. And I would have been okay, you know. But the thing was is that it was a work and that certain guys wanted to go over and certain guys wanted to do this. You know, it's the same old story with, you know, wrestling is today. And unfortunately, uh, there was, like, I know the story with Gary and the other kid, and there was just a lot of double-crossing going on there. And they had too many chiefs in that office there and no Indians. That's what the problem was. And everybody wanted to be on top. So, so what exactly what happened with Gary and the thing? Because I remember, I remember watching the tape where Gary just like took him down and held him down, and then right. it was a very strange looking match. Well, the, the, well, the problem was uh, that they promised uh, Gary was supposed to get another crack at the belt because when they brought me over there to work with him, and I put him over, he was actually the champ. And then the belt was supposed to go to him, back to Takata, to uh, Vader, and then uh, they were going to set up a match with him and Vader 
and they was going to put him over. But then all of a sudden they started going a different direction. And uh, they put him with the other kid who was a lot smaller than he was, and they wanted him to put him over. And Gary didn't want to do it because he felt that this was ruining his chances to get the belt back again. And, and I guess they got to a little shoot in the match there. So uh, then uh, they got pissed off and they didn't want to pay Gary his money and everything. And I told him, I said, you got to pay him his money. You know, I don't care. You know, he still uh, he came over here and he did what he was supposed to do, and that was it. Um, yeah, and then he ended up with the. Uh... He ended up with uh, All Japan, and you, actually yeah. UWF didn't last much longer. I no, remember it. Uh, I remember a match. Oh, what's no, go ahead. Yeah, like I said, it was just too many, uh, too many things going on in there because we, I, I, I enjoyed going over there because I worked. We'd, we'd be in Japan for a week every month, and you'd only work one one show, and that was it. And you got paid for the whole week. But the thing was that it was just too many guys in there, and everybody wanted to put each other over, and they were making a lot of money. They were selling out. Every time we went, we went to all the big arenas, and we sold out. But it was just too much going on in the office there, and the Eagles were getting in the way, and that's just what happened. Okay. You know, when you started in wrestling in yeah. uh, the mid-'70s, did you expect you were going to last 22 years? Starting uh, no, such not a... at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I had no idea, you know. I just got in there and just, uh, you know, pretty much did what I was trained to do, and I was uh, really surprised it lasted that long. I read a I read a comment and I actually sort of had heard this story before. Um, from Don, Don Callis, I uh, wrote a column about you and uh, Andre the Giant back. I guess this would be in the early New Japan days. Yeah, that's what was the story about that? Well, the story was uh, they used to uh, Vince Senior used to run the uh, Master Square Garden tournament, the single tournament. He had the team tournament, so he'd bring in all the big stars over Dusty and Hogan and. Uh, and giant and everything. So one day we were going to a town, and I was sitting in the front of the bus, and I was sort of half sleeping. I think Hogan was sitting behind me, and Dusty was on the tour, and uh, Chavo Guerrero, and, and the giant. Anyway, but he was in the back of the bus, and he started telling all these racist jokes. And I was like half sleeping. I woke up, and I heard all this nonsense going on. He's used to throwing the N-word around left and right and center. So then I finally said, look, man, I said, hey, I don't... I said, I don't like what you say, you know. If you a bigot, that's your problem. But you you just watch what you say around me, you know. So the bus got really quiet. You can actually hear a pin drop. And so as uh, the bus continued to go on, uh, all of a sudden he spoke up and with that deep voice. He said, hey, Alan, you know. And I said, yeah, he told me to go ask myself, you know. So I told the bus, I said, pull the bus over. I said, if you, if you want to talk to me like that, let's get off this bus. And I said, we can settle this now, man to man. I said, I don't care how big you are. If I have to take a beat, and it's just a beat I'm going to have to take, but you are going to know that I was there, you know. So then, uh, I said, yeah, Stan Hansen was on the bus, too. So he said, no, no, calm down. And he said, you know, it'll be okay. I said, no, no, I don't I don't accept that for nobody. I said, I don't care who you are, what you are. I don't uh, accept that call from anybody. So then uh, the next day, uh, well, that night, we got to the hotel. And the next day, I was so I was so irritated that night that I didn't sleep, and I got up the next day, and he came down uh, for breakfast, and I told him, I said, come on, let's go outside. And he didn't want to go outside. I said, no, let's go outside. We're going to talk this out, me and you, man to man, not around these assholes that are uh, sitting here. And we went out, and I told him, and I said, look, and he, he was really big at that time, and I said, let me tell you something. I said, I don't like what you say. I said, you keep your racist jokes to yourself. You want to joke around with those other guys, that's fine. You don't do that around me. So then he said, well, you know, I'm Polish to make it. I said, I don't, you never hear me make any racist remarks about anybody. I said, Andre, I don't care how big you are. I said, I'll get a baseball bat, chop you down the side, and then kick your butt, you know. And after that, for a couple of years, we really never spoke. But just before he died, I ran into him in Mexico, and we uh, actually straightened everything out. The game's after that. But, uh, how was working in Mexico? Oh, uh, it was, I enjoyed it, you know, I was crazy when I first went down there, because uh, I went there in the early 80s, and uh, it was funny, the first time, uh, we were always in uh, tag matches, I was in a six-man tag, and I'm standing out on the apron, and uh, my partner rolled out the ring, and I didn't know you were supposed to get in the ring without the tag, and I'm just standing there, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 you got to get in the ring, you know, but it was, uh, it was really crazy, I enjoyed it there, they really treated me great there, and uh, the motor looked out after me. And uh, he used to tell me every night they always have uh, two out of three falls. He always go, you, only one bump a night. <laughs> I said, that makes me happy because his rigs are like falling on the floor, you know. 
Yeah. Let's, let's, go the, let's go to the phone calls. We'll start with Wes in Virginia. Wes, you're first up with Bad News Allen. Hey, Bad News, how's it going? Uh, not bad. How you doing? Uh, pretty good. I uh, wanted to ask you, you were in Florida, didn't you, uh, with Kevin Sullivan? And, and if you did, uh, just wondering what your experiences were down there. Uh, yeah, I was down there with Kevin and uh, and uh, Ray Candy, and I enjoyed it there. I, we didn't make no money, but uh, I had a good time down there anyway. I like working with this guy. I thought Sullivan was a big time, you know. With his idea, so I thought he was crazy because at that time he used to book her down there. Also, yeah, uh, real quick. Uh, also, are you surprised that it's taken this long? I mean, people look at The Rock really not as a true African American, I guess, but are you surprised that it's taken this long, really, for one to ever get over in the mainstream? Oh, yeah. You know, like I always felt that, uh, like his father, Rocky Johnson, was a hell of a wrestler, and he was, uh, you know, uh, they gave him Bush of Florida and everything, but they never really pushed him the way he should. And there's quite a few that were around there, but, you know, it's, it's a shame that it's the year 2000 and he's finally. Uh, realize that, you know, uh, like a guy that is a Muhammad Ali type that can make a lot of money. Because Muhammad Ali made all the boxes today are uh, reaping the benefits from all the money and the publicity he brought to us. Um, I was going to say, but um, did, you have, did you ever get a chance, uh, an, I know you never worked for him, but did you ever get any offers or, or feelers or anything to work for Bill Watts during your career? Uh, no, I haven't. I okay, I was just wondering because I know um, in uh, I guess early '80s, I mean uh, down there, you're as, as they were looking for you know heels and everything, right. and I know your name came up, but I don't know if they had ever if they ever ever contacted you. I know you were working for Stampede at the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I never worked for Yeah. Uh, I had, matter of fact, I never even heard from them. So, uh, oh, okay. Right. Uh, anything else, Wes? Oh, no, thanks. Thanks for the comments, Bad News. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, thanks so much, Wes. Let's go to Matt in San Francisco. Matt, you're next up. Hey, Bad News. How's it going? My bad. How you doing? All right. Uh, hey, Dave, you may remember this. It was in the late 80s. Uh -huh. There was an independent TV station out here in the Bay Area that yeah. got the Polynesian Championship Wrestling Show. Right. Sure, because I remember seeing Ric Flair and Kerry Von Erich do a 60-minute draw. On, uh, yeah. on, I forget the station. But, yeah, uh -huh. and you, you, Bad News, worked. you were working there with Lars Anderson then. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any good stories about that time? Well, it was funny because I think somebody told me that Rock mentioned this in his book about the time uh, they had a – anniversary show for his grandfather, the Chief. And That's a right. Know, a lot of people don't know this, but the Chief, uh, my beer, when I got into the business and I came to the States because he was coming back and forth to Japan, he took me under his wing more or less because I was green as grass. And I, he more or less treated me like his son, you know. So I had some good memories about him. And so they wanted uh, Lars to drop the belt to me, and he didn't want to do it. And we got into the ring, and then he started trying to shoot with me and all this nonsense, you know, and uh, so I stretched him in the ring, and then uh, the next day we went to San Jose in California, and I was supposed to work with him again. I told him, I said, well, you got a choice tonight. You can either work with me or we can shoot. It don't make a difference to me, you know. Just said, no, 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 tonight we'll work, you know. <laughs> Wasn't there a situation, I, mean, that might, I, I seem to remember something where, uh, when he was Booker and 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 uh, he took a beating, like uh, was on one of those big stadium shows. I don't know if you were on this on that card. Uh -huh. Do you remember that? Uh, no, I actually wasn't. But uh, from what I gather was that him and Leah went to some dance with all the Samoans that night, and they got into an argument. He shoved her or something, and the Samoans beat him up. You know. Yeah, that's right. Anyway. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, what was uh, like? Um, interesting. What, some others. Well, real quick here. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is from Daniel, who says, I was a big fan of your work in WF Stampede in Japan. Uh, can you explain the incident? I don't know the story about this, actually. It says, can you play, explain the incident with the WF and the naming of Sapphire? Did you have anything to do with that? Uh, no, I didn't, actually. Uh, I went in with Vince, and I really got uh, ticked off about it, because uh, amongst our people, African-American people, that's an insult to call a woman a Sapphire, because it was taken from the old Amos and Andy movie uh, uh, TV show. And I actually went and told him that uh, he shouldn't be calling her Sapphire. I said, this is a total insult to our people. And I said, why do you want to insult my people? I said, our dollar is as good as anybody else's, you know. Well, he tried to claim he didn't know us about it, which I knew he was lying. He said, oh, I, I, I had no idea, you know. So I said, well, since you don't know. What a, what a coincidence. Huh? <laughs> what a coincidence. Yeah, exactly. So then he tells me, he says, I'm going to change her name. I'm going to change it. So he started calling her Sweet Sapphire. I said, this guy is too much stuff. <laughs> just have to have his way. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to we we got 
Uh, Steve in Calgary. What's up, Steve? Hello, uh, bad news and uh, Dave out there. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask uh, uh, bad news a couple questions. I couldn't hear what he. I can't hear what he's saying. Yes, talk, talk louder, Steve. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry there. Uh, bad news. Uh, I've been uh, a fan of yours ever since you came to Calgary, uh -huh. and uh, from way back in the Stampede days. And there's a couple questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, when the Stampede shut down or got bought out by the WWF, yeah. there was a couple of years where Calgary had a void. And then when it started up again, it started up the Stampede Wrestling again, and there was something with the names not being registered or whatever. But I, I remember I used to sit ringside all the time, and... Uh, there was a match that you were involved with. I think it was uh, either Leo Burke or his brother, Frenchie. I'm, uh -huh. I'm not even sure. I can't remember his name. But you guys were right beside me in the front row, and, and you got pile-driven on that concrete, and I, I thought I heard your stall get crushed. Now, whether that was a shoot or a work or if you got really hurt, I, uh, uh, it was amazing the kind of uh, things that go on there. Uh, the thing we did in that match was work. Uh, nothing was a shoot. Yeah, I, I remember what you're talking about. Actually, another promoter came up here and he did some digging and he found out that uh, all the years that Stu had the name, he never had it registered. So he actually brought the rights to the name and he started uh, uh, calling the Stampede Wrestling. And I worked, uh, I think, a couple of shows for him and then I went up to Japan. And by the time I got back, they closed down. Uh, I've got a really bad connection. I can hardly hear you. And we're, we're full phony from Calgary, I presume. Uh, yeah. the, the one other question I wanted to ask you, uh, being a fan uh, of yours uh, for yeah, so, so long, long, is uh, just just give me a second. I forgot here. Uh, oh, just just uh, can I ask um, Alan when you yeah. were when uh, you were wrestling? Uh, like I guess this is about eighty four ish when uh -huh. the territory was bought out. Right. Did, did, was there any inclination you're just like working as a regular job with Stampede Wrestling, and then all of a sudden one day it's like Vince bought bought us out? Is that kind of how you got the news, or was there any? Well, it was it was funny because none of the family knew. Stu called me up though. He called my house because we did TV every we would do TV every Friday, and he actually called me up and he said, uh, "Look, I sold the territory out to Vince, and he says you're going to hear about it tonight, but I just wanted to call you and let you know before." Uh, the other side, I asked him, I said, well, uh, did Bruce and uh, Brett and all them know? He said, no, they haven't, they didn't, they didn't know anything. And so apparently when I got down there, they just happened to have uh, heard it on the news that night. And all oh, hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. And I was just standing in the back. I was just tickled, you know, because I already knew, uh, Stu already told me earlier that, that uh, evening. That, uh, he hey, okay. That. One, one quick, quick question before I let you go, and, and, and the, the, what I wanted to ask you uh, uh, was, did you ever have the opportunity to work with uh, Archie the Gold or Stomp, Stomp, Archie the Stomper Goldie in Calgary here? Oh, yeah, we were just talking about that. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was asking about uh, working with Archie Goldie. Yeah, yeah, I've, uh, yeah we worked after that uh, fiasco. We worked a couple of times, and then uh, not too long after that, he left, and then I went back to Japan for a while. Terrific. Uh, all the best to you. I watch uh, Stampede every uh, Saturday at noon, and uh, I'll continue to do so uh, forever. Okay. Take care, friend. Bye-bye. Right, you. Um, you know, another thing about that uh, period, what, what, what were your thoughts? I mean, there were... There were so many hearts <laughs> okay. Okay. in Stampede. I mean, from from Wayne and Ross, and I mean, there's just like a lot of kids, and they were they were all at one point or another wrestlers. Yeah. What were your thought? What were your thoughts of the different hearts? Well, you know, I thought it was uh, it was really funny. Like uh, uh, Stu, I, I love Stu, you know, and I love Wayne. He was he was the referee, but uh, I always had problems with Brett, you know. Like I always thought, and to this day, I still dislike the guy. I mean, I, I don't make no bones about it. Because I feel that he wants to be something and he's really not, you know. He never treated the business the way the business should have been treated. And, you know, he's all Brett thinks about is himself. And, you know, he's, he's still whining about uh, what Vince did to him. You know, like, I always felt, well, you know, he was there the long, longer than anybody else. And he saw all the dirty things that Vince done to everybody. So why did he think he was any different, you know? And, you know, when we all left here, we put him over and put the belt, you know, so why couldn't he do that for somebody else? I mean, that's part of the game, you know. But I, I just uh, never really got along with him uh, that well. And actually, 
It's a, it's a funny story. When I came up in 82, I was working with him all around. And uh, when I came back in 83, uh, Stu asked me to work with him again. I refused. I said, I don't want to work with him. I said, this guy's too hard to do business with, you know. And he right. said, well, who do you want to work with? I said, put me with Dynamite. And that's how we got together. What about, uh, what about Bruce and Keith and the rest of them? Well, Keith, he never worked that much. I think I worked one match with him all the years up here, and I worked a couple of times with him in South Africa. And uh, Bruce, it's funny because a lot of people don't really realize this. I never, ever worked with Bruce all the years that I was here. Wow. And he was always in the tag in the middle of the mid-heavyweight uh, uh, title thing, and I was always uh, chasing after the North American title. So I really never worked with him all those years. You know? And uh, a lot of people don't realize that. They always thought I worked with him, and I never did. Uh, let's go to Evan in Vancouver. Evan, you're next up with Bad News. Hi, Bad News. How's it going? Good. Uh, before I ask you your question, I just want to make a comment. Yeah, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, I can't comment. Okay, but uh, my comment is that I think the, giving the title to Ric Flair was an absolute joke. I think uh, Ric Flair obviously was a legend maybe seven or eight years ago, but a uh, legend should also know when to call it quits. And everyone like praises the guy's effort, but you still have to have ability in the ring to entertain the fans. And he just lost that. And I respect him for what he's done in the past, but I just think that was a very poor move done on WWE's behalf. But for bad news, I just want to know: during your WWF tenure, don't you think your character was a bit stereotypical of the African American person? I remember your feud with Rowdy Roddy Piper, and you used to take all these like. My old remarks by Roddy Piper, like, really offensively. You thought they were offensive to the black person. Do you, so do you think that, like, may, it's, it maybe even currently, like, recently, like, in the Nation of Domination days in the WWF, do you think that black people in wrestling have been stereotyped for their characters? Uh, yeah, could you repeat that? Because I couldn't get everything you said. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it so you can okay. hear. Is but he basically was saying is, is did you think that um, when you were there that your character was somewhat of a stereotype, and do you think that, you know, wrestling has stereotyped? Oh, okay, yeah, obviously well, it has. You yeah. know, it was a stereotype, and uh, like even the part with the snake and everything, my wife really, she really hated that, you know, because she knew oh, that, that I, I, hated, I hated that too, because it was such a stereotype. Yeah, and she used to just get on my case about it. And actually, it's funny because one time uh, I had to work in San Francisco and uh, uh, San Diego, uh, excuse me, uh, Sacramento, and she she flew in and she was going to be there with me for the three days, and she just uh, just lit me up for. Almost an hour, we were driving up to the town. I, by the time I got out of the car, I was like two feet tall, you know. And I went and gave Vince my notice. But it was, everything he did was stereotype because they even came with me. He sent Pat Patterson to make a proposal that they wanted me to dye my beard blonde and be almost like a step and fetcher type of character, you know. And uh, I started laughing. I said, I, no way, shape, or form I was going to do that. I said, you guys went too far this time, you know. And he, he told me, I told Vince that. And I said, oh, you told Vince, yeah, well, let's get out. <laughs> <laughs> now, when when uh, when Roddy Piper, were you? Did, did, what did you think about when you did the match with Roddy Piper when he did the blackface? Yeah, well, it was funny because they brought me in and they asked me. I I, I never liked Piper anyway, you know. Uh, he is a bigot, actually, and I, a couple of times I had to call him on his uh, mouth and the words he likes to use. And uh, they brought me in with Vince and him, and they they said, "Well, we'd like to do this thing." <laughs> And I said, well, yeah, I said, that sounds like a good idea to me. I'm thinking, yeah, one of the brothers is going to get a hold of him and slice his throat, you know. <laughs> he deserves it. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the way they, they think, you know. They can't think that, uh, you know, everybody should be just treated equally Mark, on okay. their ability. They don't think that, you know. They always think they got to make fun of somebody, you know. E Evan, is there anything else? Uh, do you think colored wrestlers have overcome that barrier? I don't like Are that they? word, but... But did you do you think that the wrestling has gotten past that point today? Uh, I don't know. It's really hard to tell, you know, because uh, I mean, you take a look down in the WCW, you you have no African American wrestlers yeah. down there doing anything, really, you know, uh, and uh, you know Vince is barely doing anything. Well, he's got the Rock now, you know, but uh, but the Rock's never. I mean, the Rock's almost been. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, he's it's like he's never. It's like it's like the Rock is you know people don't even no one thinks of the Rock as black. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He, he's he's actually multicultural, so you know like uh, he's more or less like a Tiger Woods uh, type of uh, person. Uh, you can actually say uh, all of uh, the true African American. 
Okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia brought to you by RC Edge. The first two people to respond correctly by email to Dave Meltzer at yada.com will win a poster of a WF superstar courtesy of RC Edge. And remember to include your mailing address with your answer. Here's today's question. Uh, there was a WWF championship change that took place that was completely forgotten, or almost completely forgotten, uh, never never recognized, uh, about, because one of the participants in the match was not fired, as was expected. It's kind of curious. What match am I talking about? What was the title change that we're referring to uh, that was never actually recognized, even though it took place in the ring? So anyway, that is our question. And uh, we're going back with uh, Bad News Allen and... Uh, this is from Gabriel here, who wants to know, um, you know, when what do you, what do you think as far as things like uh, Ultimate Fighting, uh, that type of uh, genre, you know, the shoot fighting that's become popular in Japan? Because UWFI was kind of like, I mean, it was a work shoot fighting, but it, some of those guys like you know Sakuraba, who was there, is you know turned into a pretty much of a you know one of the great no holds barred fighters, I guess. And if you were younger, if, you know, if you were if you were younger and this was coming around, it would be something that would interest you, or is it just something that you wouldn't be interested in? Yeah, I think uh, if I was younger and still back in my judo days, and once I broke into this business, I would have loved to have gone into the ultimate fighting. But actually, uh, you know, by the time it came around, I was too beat up, too old to be in there doing that with those young guys, you know. Do you, do you follow it at all or no? Uh, I haven't in a while, you know. So I really don't know what's going on down there. Okay. Uh -huh. I got a question uh -huh. real quick. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Actually, first I want to apologize to Bad News. I can barely hear you, so you might have already uh, answered this question. But uh, I know you did a lot of work for uh, ICW up in Canada until, like, about a year ago. And I was wondering if there was, you know, you ever thought about doing occasional matches or anything like that, or the knees just too bad? Uh, he, he's asking me, I caught some of it, if I'm going to... Oh, okay, okay. What, what he was asking you about is, um, is there is there any chance that you would actually wrestle again now? Oh, or, no. or, or Oh, he said no. No, my wrestling days are over. Since they put in these artificial needs, that's it. Was it hard for you to to walk away from being an active competitor after 22 years and being an athlete for basically your whole life? Uh, no, not really, because uh, it was hard for me to walk away from judo after the Olympics because I trained for so long and, you know, like I said, it left a bitter taste in my mouth with all the politics that went on. But this business here was more or less the same thing, but it was easy to, for me to walk a, away from because it was show business. It wasn't something that I really had to go out there and do on my own. You know, it was all show business, so it was easy for me to leave. Now, so, so you, you, you finished judo was after the 76 Olympics, is that right? Uh, what's that? Okay, when, when, when you were, the 76 Olympics, was that, did you, did you do any judo after the 76 Olympics? Oh, uh, no, that was it. That was my last tournament. Okay, uh, and you got the bronze medal. You got the bronze medal there. Um, yes. Was there any thought, like when that thing was over, you got the bronze that you were going to stick around for four more years, or was it just like this is it? I've had it with judo. Well, yeah, I, I knew uh, before I went there because, like I said, they actually the uh, USJF, the uh, the organization that ran judo in the United States, actually tried to keep me from going to the Olympics. They didn't even want me. I was the defending uh, national champ. And they actually didn't even want me to go to the trials because another organization came along called the USJA, and I belonged to that. And it was all a bunch of young guys who were trying to uh, uh, more or less a nationalist, mystic group that wanted to have more Americans uh, push towards uh, winning, winning medals, you know. So uh, there was so much uh, fighting going on there, and there was so much politics going on. That, like I said, they actually tried to stop me from uh, going to the Olympics. And at the last moment, they changed their mind. I went to the trials, I won the trials, and I went to the Olympics and uh, won a gold medal. Uh, not a gold, a bronze, excuse me. But I knew, even before the uh, tournament started, that that was going to be my last tournament. Oh, okay. Yes. And this is, this is a question from Chris, who says uh, who was asking, uh, you kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, what what were the details of your you know basically where did you make the decision when you were leaving the WWF or how did that how did that come about? Well, you know what 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 it came down to was um, I was just so sick of the nonsense that went on. They never kept their word to me. They made all kind of promises to me. And then when I found out when I did that WrestleMania uh, uh, six, I found out that they actually paid Piper five times more than they paid me. I really really got uh, tipped off about that. You know, I thought it was totally unfair. I figured that this is show business. If anything, they should have split the money down the middle, and he got half of what he got, and I would have got half. But they figured that he 
he was in there and clicked with them, they would pay me uh, slave wages and give him all the money, and I really disliked it. So uh, I told him I was leaving. I gave him my notice that at that um, summer slam, which was the 29th of uh, August, I think it was, I gave my notice. I said, this was going to be my last match. I'm out of here. I was going back to Japan. So Vince begged me to stay until November. He said, please, please, I got all these shit because they put me with Jake. And the thing went over so big. Every time that we went in, the people really got into it that they actually begged me to stay for two more trips around the territory. Once we were going to, uh, I came in that afternoon and I did close to 100 interviews that we we're going to do uh, street fights all around and then we we're going to do cage matches all around the territory. But, so I said, okay, so I came in and I did the interviews and then that uh, night they told me they wanted me and I put Jake all over every town that we were in, I put him over. But they wanted me to put him over that night on TV and uh, on the pay per view. And I said, this don't make any sense. If I got to go two more times around the territory with him, why would the people come out business wise to see him? He already beat me. They're not going to come pay to see that. I said, don't make any sense. Why don't we save this to the end? And they, you know, like I said, Vince always has to have this way. And he just didn't see it that way. And so that was my last day there. Um, how did uh, what happened with New Japan? Was it just one of those things that did you know what what led to you going? You know what organizations did you go to? Because I know there was UWFI. Was there any other yeah. organizations you worked for in Japan? Well, I actually went to UWFI. What what the problem was that uh, Sakaguchi, who was the uh, vice president at the time when I came started in New Japan for us, him and I never got along. We just there was something I don't know what it was, but we just always had a problem. And Inuki stood between the two of us. And being that he knew he was the president and everything, he really liked me and he always took care of me. Well, after he went into politics and I went to uh, work for the WWF when I came back, he was in charge. And what he would he started doing was cutting my tours because I was guaranteed four or five tours a year. And he started cutting me down to, uh, well, he cut me down to three and then to two and then it got down to one. So uh, Takata, who used to be a member of uh, the UWF, he was actually one of our juniors at the time. Uh, years ago, when, when he started his own group, uh, UWF International, he asked me, could I come over there and do a show with Gary? They wanted me to work with him. And I said, sure. So uh, the office didn't like it. And I said, well, you know, it's unfair. I said, you got Steve Williams working for Baba and working for you, so why can't I go over there and just do this one show? And they couldn't see it that way, so I just left. Uh, this is a this is a, a question right here. Actually, this is when you mentioned Chavo Guerrero. Yeah. I think that the caller. I, I just want to make clear uh, the, that the caller was going like, "How old is Chavo?" Because his son is actually wrestling in WCW. I guess he, he was going like, "Whoa, wait a minute!" And it, it's actually the Chavo that Bad News was was referring to was Chavo Guerrero Jr.'s father, yeah, who father. Um, wrestled in uh, Japan, Los Angeles. Did you ever wrestle with Chavo in Los Angeles? Or was that or was that different time period? Oh yeah, <laughs> many a times. Actually, my last three matches were with him. In, uh, in Los Angeles before I left there. I was getting ready to go back to Japan, and we had a, a, a wrestling match, and then I challenged him to a judo match, and then I challenged him to a cage match in these three towns. But, uh, yeah, I wrestled him many times. What, was, uh, what, what, what were your thoughts as far as working in the Los Angeles territory when you worked? Because it was kind of its, I don't remember if it was his dying days, but uh, yeah. certainly the territory had seen much better days. Yeah, it was definitely on his last life. But I enjoyed it because I have a sister who's a year younger than me, she lived, she's been out there for about 30 years, so I lived with her, and, and I was with my nephews and all that. So, like, we didn't make no money, but we are home every night, so I enjoyed it. It, it gave me a, a break away from Japan at the time because I was from, uh, I was on every tour there, more or less, on Japan, and after a while it got a, a bit much, you know. So, I was like I said, I was uh, there, and we are home every night, so I enjoyed it, you know, just being out there with my family and everything. Um. Let's go to Randy in Tennessee. Randy, you're up with Bad News Allen. What's up? Hey, uh, how's, how's everybody doing? We're doing really good. Um, I can't hear him that good. Okay, talk talk really loud, Randy. Um, bad News, uh, what do you think of uh, today's wrestling, uh, WWF, WCW, and ECW? Well, you know, I think uh, when I first started in this business, uh, most of the guys weren't in any kind of shape at all. I mean, if you looked at them, you said, you know, these guys can't be no athletes. I mean, look at them, you know. They're all fat and out of shape and everything. But today's wrestlers, the guys are in the gym and they, they're working hard and everything because their bodies look beautiful. But what is missing, though, is the psychology. 
psychology that the old guys had. You had a certain psychology there that uh, they can actually just look at the audience sometime and the people would get hot, you know. But now these guys, they want to do all this crazy stuff. They're doing 101 high spots. This should be a finish. And they're using that. And then so many of them are getting injured by doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing, you know. And, like, I, I like the idea that they go to the gym and train and everything, but I think that also they should have somebody there teaching these guys the psychology of what this business is about because somehow it's just gotten lost. Anything else, Randy? Um, and also, what was your uh, what was your favorite match in the WWF? My favorite match in the WWF. It had to be working with Jake because I I enjoyed working with him. Uh, I worked with him probably more than anybody else there. You know, like they had me nine matches with uh, Hogan, and I think uh, they had me uh, with the times with uh, Macho Man. But working with Jake, I enjoyed working with him. He was really he had good psychology and he was a good worker. It was just too bad he had bad habits. And, and Dave, um, about last night's show, wouldn't you say that uh, the segment with uh, Flair and Arn Anderson last night kind of saved the show from being a real bad show? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Arn Anderson's interview was phenomenal. Uh-huh. Well, I didn't see last night's show, so. Yeah. And what did what, you, you think of the first match, uh, with the Animals versus the... I, you know, I, I actually was doing a I was doing a Yahoo chat, so I actually um, I had it on, but I I didn't hear it. If you know what I mean, so I, I, it's probably not a good thing for me to judge. I was going to watch it back on tape, and I just had not had a chance to do that. So, um, I mean, I I could see just from what I saw, I thought the filthy animals ring entrance was tremendous, but then what I was watching, it appeared they were just getting bounced around. So I was thinking, like, you know, you're going to make this great ring entrance, at least give the guy some credibility once the bell rings, and they didn't seem to do they didn't seem to do that. But maybe that's an unfair thing for me to say right now. The opener. Yeah, the, the filthy animals. Uh, yeah, that match. Yeah. Yeah, it was like they took the idea from Monday that they had with you know getting the woman down there to do CPR and everything like that, and it uh, was funny the first time, and it wasn't the second time. Well, they're going to do it. They're going to do it every TV show forever. Yeah. I'm, that's, that's certainly my opinion. You know, the woman giving the CPR. And also, how many more times are we going to see an ambulance match? Uh, at least once more in the pay-per-view. Probably that's like the probably regularly now. I think the bad part about it was that um, was it the finish actually of the match that Mike Awesome ran into the ambulance to escape from Scott Steiner? Right. Wasn't that the technical finish? Yeah. Right. So it's kind of like they've already. They've already defeated the purpose of it, and they've only done, like, two or three of them, <laughs> you know? It's going to end up like the cage match where every well, single they, week is. We're going to have gimmick matches up and down the TV show, and not one of them is going to draw a dime, and we're pretty much at that level right now. I mean, that's, that's something, you know, talking about with Alan is, um, you know, you, you would build up, whether it was WWF or, or Stampede, you would build up to a, a gimmick match that made sense, right. and if it was done right, theoretically it would up the house, and now... You know, we have these gimmick matches that are just thrown out there because they just have no, they can't, they, they feel they can't put people in wrestling matches, and the gimmick means nothing anyway, so what's the point? Well, you know, that's the unfortunate thing, especially with the WWF. They, I think they're more guilty than anybody else. Uh, before, you used to can just bring in anybody and just put them in there and let them work and let them show their talent, what they had, you know, what they could produce. But now, he's, he's gotten so that everybody has to have a gimmick, and he's got people in there he don't know what to do with, you know. And every match, like you said, is a gimmick match now. Before, you used to build up to it. Like, it would take months at a time. you tell a story, and you'd work up to it, you know. But now they just throw it in there for no reason at all, you know. Well, the, the, the old, in the old days, the gimmick, one, the gimmick would make sense, and two, the gimmick would settle something. And now, I mean, I think that, that they're afraid to ever actually put anyone over. You know, it's like they're afraid to put anyone over or have someone put someone really over. I mean, they may right. be pinfalls, but right. it's like, you know, it's like it's a pinfall, and then the other guy jumps up and starts beating him up. And so yeah. there's like it's there's no real winner and loser. And I think that it, you know, it just muffles everything. Well, you know, like I think when no I got into the stipulations, like, if you have a run in, that was like way down the road. You, know, you tell a story, but every every match now you watch is a run in or some interference or they throw a gimmick match together that means nothing. And they, like you said, they're afraid to actually have somebody just go over and win without. 50 people coming out there and beating the hell out of the guy after he won the match or whatever, you know. Don't you think, in the, the, especially especially now, even like in in uh, in the 70s and the 80s, I think people took the wins and the losses, as far as fans, yeah. a lot more seriously. And certainly the business tried to portray it as as real competition, so who won and lost was important. Right. Yeah. Now, well, now, because, well, well, 
now, today, uh, the belt means nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's traded back and forth every other week. I mean, he even got the promoter now. He was champ at one time and all this kind of nonsense, you know. So it, 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 it really means nothing no more, you know. But, I mean, the thing is, 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 is today, where, where le legitimately the wins and losses don't mean anything, they are above board and telling everyone this is all scripted, this right. is all, you know, that. And yet, they're actually more afraid to put somebody over now right. than they were back when, when it actually probably meant something as far as your, your uh, perception and your position. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure that I agree with you there. It makes no sense at all, you know. Okay, we've got to... There's somewhere along the line, the psychology of this business has gotten totally lost. Totally lost. Okay, we, that uh, William Sanders from North Carolina and Scott Look from Maine were winners in our WWF trivia contest. Uh, the match that we were referring to, this was a WWF championship. It was actually a tag team title match uh, where the Rockers, this was in uh, 1990, defeated the Hart Foundation. And the reason that that match took place in Fort Wayne, Indiana, was because the plans were to fire Jim Neidhart. And then about a couple of days later, I don't know what decisions were made in the WF booking, but they decided to keep Jim Neidhart and just ignore that the title ever changed hands. They actually did a promo locally to explain to the local fans who had been to the show, saying that the ring ropes were not tightened at the right tension, so therefore the match was ruled. <laughs> that it, Did they break? I think the ring ropes broke or something, yeah. So they ruled that as the reason that it was... Jack. They had Jack Tunney make an announcement for the for the fans in Fort Wayne who had seen it, and it was just ignored in the rest of the rest of the country. So, so anyway, that was, that was the story on that one. And also, WCW, this is an email from Eric, who says, WCW is promoting a major announcement from Terry Funk Monday on Nitro, saying that Terry's wife and Dory Funk will be at the show. So I guess they're trying to imply that Terry Funk is retiring. <laughs> How many people can can we have retire? Like every week on wrestling, we have to have three people retire, right. and 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 when someone finally does, no one's ever going to believe it. Yeah, really. That's like unbelievable, especially Terry Funk of all people. I mean, did you ever? Were you ever in the same territory as Terry Funk? Uh, no, I, I no, I wasn't. Uh, actually, when I used to. Uh... Uh, work Japan. He was with New Japan for uh, excuse me. He was with All Japan for wrestling, and I was with New Japan for wrestling. So I never really worked the same territories with him. But he's quite a uh, character, though. Yeah, yeah. Did you, like you said, you know, everybody retires every other week. Well, this is like I'm having a hard time convincing people that I'm actually retired. They don't want to believe it, you know. <laughs> but they still call you up and go, "Oh, please, just uh, work our show next week." People calling me up and everything. Oh, we, we got some uh, guy called me from Connecticut. We running some shows up here. We like I said, look, I told you I'm retired. I'm not wrestling anymore. You know. Did you? Um, I, I guess you probably never would have um, met him. Maybe you have. I don't know. Did you ever uh, run into Jumbo Saruta? Uh, Jumbo, no, I never did meet him. No, not yeah. at all. You, you, did you, you know, I don't know if you heard, but he passed away a couple of days ago. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, a Saturday, actually. Oh, yeah. wow, he's a young guy. I mean, he, he's a lot younger than I was. Yeah, 49. He was, um, it was, uh, he was having a kidney transplant, and I guess he bled to death in surgery. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's really sad. Yeah, it is. No, I never met him. It yeah. Be, you know, like, there was always a heat between Bobber and Inuki's group, you know, uh, uh, always the Nookie's group would claim, you know, our wrestling was harder looking than theirs, and there was more too American, you know, that's how they used to put it all the time, you know. So that yeah. Kind of, uh, that's a shame. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got, uh, let's go to David in Cincinnati. David, you're on the line with Bad News. Hey, uh, how you doing, Dave? I'm doing good. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you something. Um, I don't like to bring Bob Ryder's name up very much, but, um, you can. Uh, it's okay. You said uh, <laughs> in, in your observer, uh, you talked about the buy rate for slamborees being uh, so low. Very low. That like WCW wouldn't even uh, acknowledge it. Uh, they would not give a number. I was told by someone in the company it was well below point two, but they couldn't tell me how low, much below point two is because uh, it, it they didn't want it out. So it's below point two. Well, we'll get the exact number. We'll get, I mean, not exact, but we'll get a good number within a week or two. It always comes out. But, yeah, I know he's, like, trying to spin it that it wasn't a bad buy rate. I mean, it was, what can you say? Below point two. I mean, w the number speaks for uh, Wait, he said on his, uh, I don't listen to WCW Live, so I'm not going to, I don't know the exact words, but on the recap of OneWrestling.com, he, uh, he criticized you for uh, printing that, and he said that WCW never releases buy rate information. I know, and he and he's released buy rates of WCW on almost every show up until uh, this one, right? <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? Even, even, even uh, 
there must be some conspiracy because I remember he released. Um, I remember, didn't there wasn't there a buy rate that did a point eleven? I think it was uncensored. It was a point point one three, which he said was a point one two, which probably you know it's probably it's not, it's not saying one of them was right or wrong because it's not an exact science. Well, I was wondering why would Bob, Bob Ryder? Why did he you know, release a point one three? Why did he release a point one three when he works for the company? I don't know, think about that. Think about why he did that. When this one he won't release it. Think about that. I think the the answer is obvious if you think about it. Well, I'm just thinking, like, I mean, why? Yeah, but why would he? Obviously, he like didn't want Kevin Sullivan in charge, since, I mean, I don't understand, like, why he would actually acknowledge a point one three in his so-called independent notes from Bob column online. Um, I, I think that you just answered your question. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, hey, um, I got a question for Bad News. Yeah. Bad News, can you hear him? Uh, not too well. Can okay. You, uh, can you hear this? I'll, I'll, yeah, just just tell me and I'll, I'll ask him because he can hear me. Can you hear that TV? Bad news. It's an interview for, uh, with bad news. Uh, from from when? Uh, Saturday night's main event, right before a match with Hogan, which I remember. Uh, bad news actually carried Hogan to a pretty good match. Oh, he said you carried Hogan to a good match. On <laughs> <laughs> Saturday night's main event. <laughs> And if I'm not, I don't know. I kind of remember seeing some good matches between Bad News and Savage. I remember Bad News and Sa Savage. Uh, God, I saw, I saw. Was it Bad News and Savage in in Chicago? I remember it was really weird because Savage had just gone heel on television with a feud with Hogan, but he was still booked with with Bad News yeah, at the house shows. It was very strange watching yeah. Savage work a match as a babyface against you and then turn heel after the match was over because he was supposed to be a heel. I saw that in Chicago once. Um, you know, yeah. I, thought, I thought that was probably the, one of the dumbest. Uh, well, I, they've done more dumb things than, since then. But I thought at that time that was pretty stupid, you know, because he was working with me. And even I remember one time we were in San Francisco, and, you know, that's when they was trying to turn him a heel to work against Hogan. And the people just booed the heck out of me, and everything he did, they would just boo me and cheer him, you know. Speaking of uh, OneWrestling.com, uh, Dave Shear uh, once commented, he said, like, the worst gimmick he ever saw was when you brought a rat to the ringside. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> whose idea was that? That's Dan. Vince? Every, every Vince. idea that you see them uh, do on TV is their idea, you know. Everyone. He said it was Vince's idea. Yeah, that's Vince's idea. That was, that was pretty bad. Actually, the, one of the, what was real interesting is I remember like real like a little bit later they had like Jake Roberts and Snake Damien killed and then they like immediately dropped the angle and then before you knew it Earthquake was, the guy who killed a snake was teaming up with them uh, with Jake for a Survivor Series match. Yeah. Well, they 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 do stuff like that quicker these days though than they did then. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing with that. But the thing with Macho Man, if I can remember correct, correctly, I don't think that uh, Macho Man. Yeah, I don't like. They, I don't think he like became a full fledged heel until after that uh, WrestleMania five match. I think it was just like. Back no, no, they the, wanted it, they wanted him. They, he was total heel off of the Saturday Night's main event. A lot of times, how often did they tape those uh, Saturday Night's main events in advance? In those, in those days, it could have been anywhere from like a day or two to about a week or two. I remember, I remember whenever I went to those like WWF TV tapings in like the uh, late '80s or early '90s. God, I'd sit through like six hours of just squash matches. And I went to many of those. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, the first time they came up here to uh, uh, do TV, they did one in Edmonton, and my all my in-laws live up there, and they had no idea that it was going to be, uh, you know, the squash matches and what TV was like. And I got them tickets and everything, and they went. And my youngest nephew really liked Hogan because a couple of times Hogan would give him take pictures with him and everything, and he never did see Hogan work that night because he would go on last. Sometime it was 12:31 in the morning. You know, I remember working with him in the dark match. It was the main event in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, we went in went into the ring at 1:15 uh, in the morning. Oh, that's brutal. And it, it, you know, like they had maybe five people in the audience left. The people who cared, we killed each other. You know. Oh man, because yeah, I mean, I remember going going to see a lot of those shows. You know, well after midnight, and then Hogan would come on. And then sometimes Hogan would go out and do like a. I saw him do like two and three minute matches sometimes. Yeah, exactly. You know, after people had waited all that. Then it was so late. I'm. I, I can almost see why, but it was like. Well, well, I went in the Huntsville. We went out like three minutes. You know. Yeah. Because, uh, just the people were so fed up with seeing. You know, they've seen a hundred matches before they saw that one. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else, Dave? Or... Uh, no, I. I was just gonna say like, it got old watching all those Papa Shango matches. 
<laughs> well, it didn't matter who it was. By the, I just remember going to the Wrestling Challenge tapings where they would tape like four four TV shows in one night. Yeah. By the by the uh, fourth time you've seen the same guys, you yeah. know, squash guys in three minutes, it didn't matter who it was. It one was of the, a one of, those, uh, one of those house shows that I went to it was really awesome. They had a Bret Hart Shawn Michaels match and a Macho Man Ric Flair match in one show. Yeah. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I remember. You know, I, I mean, I saw the, I saw some good shows too. Just. I also I also wanted to comment. You said that uh, like the sellout streak ended in Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I went to that. I went to that house show. There was still like a ton of people there, even though it wasn't like totally sold out. And I remember mm-hmm. the last few times I went there, uh, it did sell out. And the last WCW show there was a sellout. It was that uh, pay per view where Chris Benoit. I'm not sure if I should say won the title because the match well, never it, happened. It, it, that, that show, I mean, that show you could say was a sellout, but when half the tickets are freebies, you know what I mean? I, I don't consider that a sellout. You know, with, with, when the WCW did the pay per view in January, I mean, they, they, you know, they gave away so many tickets to that show, but it was, pa- I know it was packed. There, there is a Nitro coming July 31st. How do I get free tickets? <laughs> because I hear uh, about how they pay for the audiences. I don't know how they do it. I mean, I think usually just like in a lot of places, just go to the college. You know, <laughs> that's where they give them away. It's a lot of college kids. Cause, I you know, start they, walking around there. They're gonna be guys like handing me tickets. I don't know about that, but uh, it's you know maybe uh, by then it'll be hard to get over. Like with what were what Wade Keller reported, the third they had like a thirteenth caller would get free nitro tickets, and there never was, was a thirteenth caller. It was, it was a Thunder in Pennsylvania. They said the 13th caller would get uh, tickets when they did the Thunder in Philadelphia. Yeah, and they never had 13 callers. Yeah, <laughs> that was sad. That was, that, that was that was when it was worse than it is even now. Well, with the Sullivan regime. Yeah, the Sullivan regime. I mean, you know, no matter what anyone say, it's 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 better now. It's not. The logic's probably no better, but at least there's I mean, a lot more. The advantages more... though of now is the Sullivan regime. They never had like Kevin Nash, or they never had like the big names that they that Vince Russo hot shotted back. Yeah, all the guys that are still injured that they have working matches. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. All right, Dave. Uh, I guess I better get going. So okay. uh, it was nice talking to you. I guess we'll see you at the Pillman show. Yep, I'll be there. All right. Okay, let's go to Massad in Pennsylvania. You're going to be our last caller. Hey, Dave. Hey, how are Brand you? News. How are you guys? Uh, not bad. Um, yeah, Dave, I wanted to ask you uh, about the D-Lo situation right now. Are they just keeping him off, uh, off matches because they think he's sloppy or what? I don't, I don't know what the situation is with him. You know, there's... I can't give you a good answer there. You know, I mean, they have so many guys, and there's a couple guys like Val Venus and D'Lo Brown, for whatever reason, are just kind of like they haven't really had a role. And then on, on the show that actually airs tonight, you know, they're going to put Val Venus in a role where he's, you know, going to challenge the Benoit Jericho winner. You yeah. know, they did a little they did a little program with, with D'Lo and the Godfather, but, you know, it didn't really go anywhere. I mean, they weren't hot as a team, and then they split them up, and, and it's just not a good program. You know, he came out with the pimp outfit, and, yeah, I don't know. It wasn't the right thing for him anyway. If, if you were going to give a program, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, anyway, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. If you were going to give a program to either Val Venus or Dilo, who would you pick? Oh, man, I don't know. They're, they're, I kind of, kind of consider them at this, about the same level right now. Dilo right. might be a, a little better worker, but Val Venus is more charismatic as a talker. At least yeah. he can't, you know, so... Um, I don't know. I mean, they just have to come up with storylines, and right now they just haven't been thinking about those guys. I don't know if there's a, you know, a, a specific reason. I mean, some people think it's because you know D'Lo may have entertained offers to go to WCW, and they've kind of iced him for a little while. I mean, that could be. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Do you? Th- well, can you recommend uh, an All Japan match? That's one so far. Any, I can get. Any, uh, Any Misawa. Misawa Kobashi, the one that won match of the year in '98, was like one of the great matches of all time. But I mean, any... what month that was in? Oh God, I forget off the top of my head. Um, but any any Misawa Kobashi match, I think, will you know is is they're 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 all tremendous. Yeah. I mean, it's the best it's the best feud in wrestling in the ring. Uh, you remember uh, Wrestle Wolf, Wrestle War, uh, Flair Steam? But were you at that show? Uh, the one in Nashville. Yeah, the one that so it was the match of the year. Yeah, I was match at that one. Year, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, that one. Yeah, I thought, thought I saw you on, on the on the tape. Um, oh wow, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, enough ribbing about my haircut. There. What? No, no. Okay, Brian's got something to say. Oh yeah, Brian. I'm just wondering uh, why you would ask me was there if he was on the tape. Because uh, 
I was asking because uh, I was in the Netco print, and he was like, uh, well, there's Dave Meltzer with an afro. And <laughs> I just uh, started laughing. That, 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 that's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never, never have photos of you put in a magazine ten years after they were taken. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I'm going to leave now. Just before I leave, I just want to ask you another question. Um, do you think RVD would ever go to Big Two or not, Van Damme? Uh, someday he will, you know, when his contract's up or something. or You know, you got to think he's a young guy sooner or later. I sure, I sure hope he goes to WWF because I just can't stand WCW. And I really want to watch him. All okay. right. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. All right, Dave. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, we are pretty much uh, out of time right now. Bad news. I want to thank you very much for doing the show tonight. This was, uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun. What, are, but what stuff um, besides the announcing for Stampede? Um, do you uh, guest appearances or things like that on on any of the shows, or what, what's what's going on like in the in the Canadian and you know that area, Western Canada? Well, there's not much going on now, but uh, um, uh, Tim Flowers runs a lot of stuff out in uh, Vancouver, and uh, sometime in September uh, she'll be going out there to help him out again. And also, is there is, is there anyone that's working in Stampede that that like you think that like people should just kind of keep their eye out out for some of the guys you think really have a lot of promise? Yeah, well, I think uh, that Pistol Pilot has a lot of promise. He reminds me of the young Dynamite, and you got Tiger Khan, who I think is a good worker. You got the Johnny Divine, who's a heck of a worker and a really good talker. He's uh, I don't know if anybody wants to give him a, a chance because he's really small, you know. But I mean, you could do anything with anybody. What do you think? I mean, when we're running like totally low in time, I, you know, you were actually there during that period where Dynamite and uh, Satoru Sayama pretty much put the smaller guys on the map. I mean, what, what were your thoughts like being being in Japan when that stuff was going on, as far as the lighter weight guys? Well, I thought, uh, like I said, there's some matches that I would pay to see, and there's some matches that you couldn't pay me to go see. But <laughs> what, uh, when you have uh, 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 Sayama. Uh, Tiger Mask and Dynamite, I would pay to go see them. Uh, Chris Benoit and Lager. I mean, these guys used to have tremendous matches. I remember an incident where they brought Dynamite and uh, Tiger Mask to New York, to Madison Square Garden, and Vince Sr. was still alive. He was still running everything. And uh, Bob Backlund was the champ at the time, and they put those two guys on second, and they tore the house down. I mean, the people just, and you know, usually people from New York, they're pretty hard, hardcore and they're skeptical of everything. But they actually gave them a standing ovation. And Ben Senior almost had a heart attack. He's going, well, what, what am I champion? How is he going to follow those guys? You know, and he said, well, nobody can follow them. So, you know, so he's to cry about it enjoy what they did, you know. But uh, yeah. he always had this thing, if you weren't six feet and over, he didn't want to use it. So, but I was glad, even though, like, I don't like a lot of things that Ben Senior's done. At least he, one thing he's done is gave everybody a chance, no matter what size you were. Yeah, I think a, a lot of that was a Sayama, and then then later Rey Mysterio really opened that up. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I, I like what they've done because uh, you know they brought excitement to to the ring because okay. there's certain guys. Uh, not, I'm not ashamed to say, you know, like Hogan, he's always had charisma, but he was never a good worker, and now he's embarrassed, and I think he should have retired five years ago already. You know, and, okay. And give the young guys a chance to get rid of those. Okay, bad news. I want to thank you very much for doing the show. And tomorrow, don't forget.